You will turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll try not to keep you very long. I've been in churches where if you turned around, it was Acts 2.38. And I love that. Most people go to church all their life and never know 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 are in there. I don't think sometimes the grace people are really grateful for what they know. You know the greatest message in the world, the greatest thing that was ever offered to anyone, the gospel. And this is the only thing you need to know to go to heaven and trust. You could uh, get saved today and we get caught up and you get as much as I do or Steve or anybody else. All spiritual blessings. Somebody said one time when my dad was dying, <clears throat> he, uh, he had cancer. And I went and told him the truth the best I could. And one person got mad at me because I was administering to him morphine. They said, well, that's addictive. And I said, well, aren't you smart? <laughs> but my dad, I think, saw the truth at the end. I hope he did. That's all I can do is hope. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, according to the book of Psalms. But the power of God is not me, Steve, or anybody else in here preaching. The power of God is the gospel of Christ. And said, well, it ain't fair for your dad to get saved on his deathbed. Uh, I've been saved for 20 years. What difference does it make? Maybe this is your day. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, maybe you're the last one. Trust it. We'll get out of here. That would be great. But I was counting up uh, in the ministry, and I, I asked you to pray for the Darlington class. I had it 28 years. I gave it up uh, four weeks ago for, to another man. I, it was kind of an emotional thing, but uh, I'm staying home on Sunday night with my wife. Uh, I've been doing that for 28 years, a long time. And it was emotional. I had some women in there crying, and, and I said, you don't need to cry. It's not based on me. It's based on the Bible. And if you believe the Bible, and, and, you, and I did a well job of teaching you, you'll accept this man readily and go right on about it. And uh, I said, he's a good man. He, he believes the gospel. He believes the King James Bible, and so I'm glad of it. But I was counting up the, the other day. I have uh, over 2 million miles in Bible studies. I'm tired. <laughs> but you know what? It don't matter. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to talk to you about the faith. I had another message in mind, but I'm not going to do it. I just want to do this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I call this the oneness chapter. You know, they call Hebrews 11 the hall of faith. Well, I call this the oneness in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all loneliness and meekness, with all long suffering, uh, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity in, uh, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And, a lot of this has been dealt with this weekend very well, uh, especially the God and the Father and the, the calling and the hope and whatever. But I want to deal with the one faith here uh, in, just pray for me, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now we obviously know there's more than one faith in the Bible, but there's one faith that matters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul was concerned about the Corinthians. Obviously, when he said what he did in 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered unto you first of all. He wasn't concerned whether he stood up there and taught them great lessons and showed his great knowledge. He was there to present to them the gospel of Christ because it was the power of God unto salvation. So he said in, in verse 5, that your faith, now he he says in the first four verse, verses, and I'm not going to take the time you can read, he's talking about in the, the first four verses of what he determined not to do and determined what to do. But in verse 5 he said that your faith, so whose faith? 
the Corinthians, right? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right, turn to Romans chapter 3. So if we find more than one faith, we're probably going to have to make a decision on that one faith, what it is in Ephesians chapter 4. All right, in, Fe in Romans chapter 3, verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of who? The faith of God. Well, I've, now I'm seeing two faiths. I see your faith, the Corinthians. Now I see the faith of God without effect. And unbelief will not make the faith of God without effect. It, it, uh, you can go through this life and never trust Christ, and it'll never change what Christ did. And you won't go to the judgment of the great white throne and be judged for your sin. You'll be judged for unbelief because you wouldn't receive the love of Christ that God supplied when he sent his son. His son had faith. He had faith that I have no, I, I can't even imagine what it felt like to be the creator of heaven and earth, to come down into this mess and love it enough to let them do what they did to him. And they did. And, you know, people say, well, Peter and Paul's got the same gospel. Well, if you'll read Peter's description of what he's fixing to tell them in Acts 2, it's murder. Amen. They killed the Messiah. That is not what that says. That says, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. He wasn't murdered for our sins. He died for our sins. Do you realize that when you say the sinner's prayer, you're thinking God must be really stupid. If he died for our sins before you were born, I'm pretty sure you don't have to tell God you're a sinner. I'm pretty sure he already knew that. Don't you? Don't you, don't you figure that God knew you were a sinner? Did he know the only way for you and I, the Gentiles, as Mark was talking about, without hope, without God, without Christ, had any way to him at all, he had to make the way? And he did. And Jesus gave himself. Well, Who did he give himself to? <laughs> did I do something wrong? <laughs> He gave himself for our sin. You know, uh, as a father, would you want your child to die in front of you? What if somebody had your child and had that child in some kind of a miserable position, just miserable position, and was fixing to skin them and kill them right in front of you? How would you like that? God watched his son die by the creation he created, by the son, deny him, strip him in front of his mother, had spit on him, and like Mark was talking about, you couldn't, you couldn't see Jesus as being what he was. They had done so many things to him. And God lets that all happen for Jerry Sanders. I've never done anything to deserve anything but wrath. And my Savior became sin for me. But that's not, that's not the end of the story. My Savior went into hell. So that I wouldn't. And then he went up where Mark was talking about far above all heavens and took me with him. And I don't have to do nothing. I don't even have to be a nice guy. And I know everybody thinks I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I don't have to be anything because God forgave me when he raised his son. 
How dare you deny him? Because he will deny you if it comes to that point. You know, in Acts chapter 13, those people, when Paul preached, and I was thinking about Barnabas. How many of you ever thought about Barnabas? You know that a Barnabas is included in the ministry? Acts 13 says so. He said, separate me Barnabas and Paul for the, uh, Saul for the ministry wherein I've called them. And he is called an apostle. It said Paul and Barnabas are the apostles. He's an apostle. And did you know that when they got into one of them fleshly things, God wasn't mad at Barnabas. Never said he was. You know, we get to worry about and we get some kind of little judgmental thing about us and, you know, somebody leaves us and they hurt our feelings. And we just, you know, I, I know they're wrong. And, oh, I'm thinking they're out of the will of God. Was Barnabas out of the will of God? Was he? He went back to Cyprus. When Paul, later on in the book of Acts, they went by and found Cyprus. Did you ever hear Paul talk about Barnabas bad? I uh, wonder how those disciples around that area got to be disciples. Do you reckon that somebody could be a saint and get mad at you or you get mad at them and leave and then, as we always preach, you're sealed, then we think they're unsealed? <laughs> they're not. And all things work together for good. If they preach doctrine against you and are hateful in your ministry, hey, stand against them. Show the truth to your people and go on about your business. He never said make anybody accursed. He said let them be accursed. He never said you had to kill them. He said mark them and avoid them. He also said they can recover. Amen. Folks, this is a new crowd to me. I don't, I've been coming to every one of Steve's conferences for years and years. All of them, I guess, still I need a donut either. <laughs> Hold that record. Uh, this is kind of a new crowd, and that's praise God, but where's all the people we used to know? Well, you know what? That's up to God. What if they're out there doing what we taught them to? Amen. What if they're out there witnessing, and someday you run into somebody, and they say, oh, I got my gospel from that individual, and you go, no, he couldn't have given it to you. He let me. Folks, I, I, I just leave it alone. You know why? It's up to God. All things work together for good. To them to love God, to them who are the called according to his promise. What it's up to us as preachers is to teach the faith of Jesus Christ, to teach and preach the gospel of Christ, and to leave it alone. Amen. You know why? God will work it out. He'll work it out this year. You're and I sitting here. All right, so we found two faiths. Your faith, the faith of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians 13. I always tell people you won't know the difference 100 years from now anyway. It won't make no difference. It's hard when you lose people, and it's hard when people get mad at you or they leave you over something and, and they never talk to you about it and all that, and it breaks your heart. But uh, again... Uh, how did that feel? How do you reckon that felt? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God will never forsake you if you're saved. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Faith. Faith. I was sick the other day. I was having some serious pains. We went to uh, Hawaii with Jimmy and Jan, and I, it was awful. And it was moving all around my face. I didn't know what it was. Went to the emergency room. They said, well, we're going to check you for temporal artery problems. That was come back negative. They were glad. And then they put a CAT scan on my head and couldn't find any kittens or anything. So... Uh, <laughs> Said that was negative, and I said, Well, I'm going to the dentist. So 
I missed the Bible class, went to the dentist. She got this x-ray thing where you step up and put your mouth on it. Five minutes, she comes out, there it is. It was a bad tooth. She said, now, I don't know if I can fix it. I said, I don't want it fixed. I want it gone. <laughs> and so she pulled it out. But you know how she found out? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, verse 1, uh, of our, the first word. What does it say? Examine. Well, he tells us to do something here. Examine yourselves whether you be where? It did not say examine yourself whether you be have faith. It said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus uh, Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. All right? My question is, how do you know you're in Christ? How does this process work? Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 10. Real quick. I'll let you go. Your car, I hope it'll start. I said to a guy one time, I said, do you believe your car will start? And he said, yes. I said, I've got a gun here. I'm going to put your head. Do you trust it will start? And he looked at me and he said, no, wait a minute. What are you saying? I said, do you trust that car to start? If it don't start, I'm going to shoot you. And he said, there's a difference between believing and trusting. And then I said, yes, there is. Folks, all your religions believe that in a historical fashion. But they also believe you've got to walk the aisle, which there's no aisle in the Bible. And then you've got to lay your sins on an altar, and you never lay sins on an altar. You lay a sacrifice of purity. And you don't know who that is because it says this do in remembrance of me, but you're not sure who me is. Okay? And then you turn from your sins, and how many had good luck with that? <laughs> I've got a 360 degree rotation of sins. No matter what degree I turn, I've got a sin there awaiting me. So I didn't turn from my sin. Did I give my life to Christ? He really didn't want my life. He wants his life to be through me. Uh, I didn't confess my sins because I didn't have any. I think that's been thoroughly brought out in his conference. Did he not forgive us and take care of all of it? Amen. Now, so what am I supposed to do? How do I get in Christ? Well, I got Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God will raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. According to Paul's gospel in Romans 2 Timothy 2, 8, it said, Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Okay, so God, Paul's gospel is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There ain't no doubt about it. And he said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. And you know, if you'll get to searching that in Philippians, you'll learn something that I might know him. And if you read before that, why would he know him? Because he gave up everything that he did and counted it as done. Do, do you think there are some preachers on TV that could do that? That they could stand before you and say, oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me? I've been wrong. I, everything we've ever done here is nothing but as dumb. No, they can't do that because they don't believe that. They believe in their works to be worthy of that. If we're worthy of that or could get worthy of that, why did he die? Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession made unto salvation. Okay? Now, verse 13, this is the only verse we have in the Bible. So when I read it, what are you going to do? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the only verse we got in the Bible. What are you going to do? Well, what's his name? You're a Gentile. It's Allah? Maybe it's Muhammad. Confucius? I'm a Gentile. Gentiles believe all kinds of things, don't they? Whosoever's called the name of the Lord. Uh, there's an apostle in the Bible in Acts chapter 9. He said, Lord, who art thou? Don't sound like he's calling on him. Sounds like he's asking him who he is. Is he blind? Is he a blind Jew on the ground asking who he is? Did I do something wrong? Yes. A blind Jew on the ground asking who 
Jesus is because he don't know Jesus. He don't believe Jesus raised from the dead. He don't believe in none of that. He's persecuting people that said that Jesus raised from the dead. And he's saying, Lord, who art thou? So Jesus takes it for granted he knows him. He said, you know who I am. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now, you ever had a lump in your throat? He had it. And he began to examine. I, I just see him examining his mind. Oh my God, I've been killing and persecuting people that believe in who I'm talking to. It had to come home, didn't it? Lord, what you have me do? You ever been afraid to ask that? Have you? Lord, what will you have me to do? Instead of saying, Lord, I did this. I did it. I walked out. Lord, I, I turned from my sin. Lord, don't you know I love you? I never knew you. Lord, what will you have me do? Trust me. You know, people trust Jesus Christ for their salvation, but they have trouble trusting him in their everyday life. I don't know how you could do that. You just might as well just drop down and sit down and rest on the Lord because if you can trust him for salvation, that's the greatest thing in the world. Then trust him for everyday life. Uh, what, you think he's going to leave you? Well, they trust us later. They're on their own. Just go on and leave them alone. Wow, would that be fun. What a mess we'd make then, wouldn't we? I made a mess before I saved. I made a mess after I'm saved. And the Lord, he straightens it all out because all things work together for good. That's an easy verse to quote, but it's not an easy verse to live by when you got water in your house. <laughs> when you're laying in a hospital and a car doesn't run over you. Or you're laying there getting a stent put in or, or whatever's happening. You're laying in a hospital. How can all things be working together for good? Because God works it out. How could it work out good that we've got two men walking together and they are walking together and do you know what Barnabas' name means? Son of consolation. It means the word to help and walk alongside of. And he did with Paul. But then that flesh got involved and they had a little argument, you know. And so Barnabas went this way and Saul stayed here. And God never said anything bad about it. He just recorded it. Isn't that amazing? Do you know who in the lineage of Mary is her relative? Bathsheba. I doubt Bathsheba would be considered as a, the person that should carry the lineage of the Lord. Wasn't she a stolen woman? Wasn't she the wife of another man that David had killed? Was he the brother of the king of Israel that nobody knew nothing about? I'm trying to get you to think, folks. Maybe you think you're sitting out there and, and God is using you, but nobody gives you any credit and nobody knows you. It don't work that way, folks. There's no big I and little U's. We all members of the body of Christ. But how did you get in Christ? All right, now watch. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they not believe? And how shall they believe in him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. So I guess you got to call on the name of the Lord, but you won't call on him to him unless somebody preaches to you. I like what uh, Mark was talking about. Do you support people around that are close to you making the effort to put out a Bible study? Do you come and visit them or you just say, well, I'm too tired, i got to wash my cat. <laughs> and you never go. I've been to many a Bible class where there's one person. 
Went to one Bible class one time and nobody showed up and I was fixing to pack up my stuff and leave. And then what they do? They all come in about 10 minutes later and I'd already lost my temper and I had to apologize to the Lord. <laughs> Typical. I was ready to go. And then they all come in late. I got one person that comes in Bible class 31 minutes late. Weekly. <laughs> That's charity. Uh, where did I tell you? First Timothy 3? Galatians. Galatians 3. I'm losing my mind here. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. Look with me in verse 21. Is the law against the promises of God, God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure the preachers haven't read that, uh, you know, in religion. But I want to go back to verse uh, three, are you so foolish? Now the Lord warned about calling people foolish, didn't He? But Paul is not in jeopardy by doing this. He said, "Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit, and some of the translations will change that to in the Spirit. By the way, I'm talking about the King James, but it's the printers that change it. And Nelson's one of them. And he'll put, Nelson put in there, he that ministered to you in the spirit. Now that sounds like he's drunk. That's not what that says, folks. It says, he therefore that ministereth to you the spirit. Okay? I'd say that probably go along with Mark. Uh, did God minister us the spirit? through the Apostle Paul as Gentiles. Folks, you're not going to heaven unless you have something. You know what it is? The Spirit of Christ. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, if you don't have, and uh, the brother that preached the other night, in that verse in Romans 8, 9, it says the Spirit of God, then he identifies the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. They're one, but they're called two different things in that for a reason. And it's the same thing in Galatians chapter three, uh, 2. Now watch, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? How many of you in religion knew it was the faith of Christ? Well, what kind of religion are you going to? You didn't know that, did you? Somebody said it don't make any difference. Then this verse is a lie. Now watch. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed, say it. Amen. There's the word in, okay. In Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Okay, how do you get justified by the faith of Christ? Well, then that matches Romans 8. Turn with me to Romans 8. Now, I'm, ex I'm trying to get you to examine yourself. Do you or do you not have eternal life? And why would God justify you to eternal life? Now watch. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What became before the predestination? Foreknowledge. For, though, for whom he did predestinate, them he also what? He what? He called. Is that not what verse 30 says? Did he predestinate you by foreknowledge? You mean to tell me that God looked in the future and saw you and now he's really confused that you're doing some sinning that he didn't see? How did he see you? Romans 5, verse 6, 8, and 10. Ungodly sinners and enemies. Yes or no? Amen. Did he see you as an ungodly sinner and enemy when Christ was dying? Did he see you before the foundation of the world? That's what you were doing. And yet he saw you and predestinated you, but that still don't do you no good. Again, it comes back to the Gentiles. Unless the Gentiles get called, they ain't going to ever know. 
Now watch. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also what? Then what happened? What? When did you get justified? Somebody said, they always said, well, he justified me right here. Why? He said he was raised again for our justification, correct? For our justification. But you're not ever going to be justified until you're called. And you're never going to be justified and then called unless you receive it. How do I know? Romans 5. Romans 5. Watch what it says. Now, did you come in this world by Adam in a really good shape? What was your predestination there? Death. Death. What you want to be is adopted. Okay? Well, the spirit of adoption is what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1. All right, now watch. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. The brother was talking about the, the inspiration of the scripture. In the inspiration of the scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, does it say for instruction in righteousness? You know why you need instruction in righteousness? Because you ain't never been righteous and you don't know how to be righteous. So you get instruction in righteousness. He shows you in righteousness of God. How? And you know, like Mark was talking about, there's all kinds of things in Paul's writings of how to walk and how to live. And if you don't ever read it, you don't know. So the God's world don't want you reading Romans through Philemon. He wants you walking in your righteousness. You know, your righteousness. But there ain't none righteous. So when you go before the Lord and you got your bag of righteousness, you present Him your righteousness and it's empty. And not only is it empty, the bag burns. But what if you got Christ's righteousness imputed to you? But He'll never come except by the faith of Jesus Christ. Let's read it again. He says in verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto what? Is there ever a day when you received a gift? When I first started preaching, people began to give me money and, and things and help. and <clears throat> I had always worked in my life. And it was, it's hard to receive things without earning them. And you always wonder, what do you want out of this? What's your motive? They're giving it to you. And so you have to learn to receive it without deserving it. You see, Paul said, what's that word up there right after which I also... Can you imagine a Benjamite saying he was a sinner? I hear these idiots preaching in Acts 2, and I'm sorry I used the word, but that's what they are. In Acts chapter 2, repent of your sins. Those are law-abiding Jews. They're the day at Pentecost. You can't convince them they're sinners. They're full of blood Jews. Don't you remember when Peter had the sheep let down? No, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. You come in contact with some people that are so self-righteous that you try to show them why Christ died. They don't need him to have died for them. They are presenting what they've done for God and their righteousness. You have none. There is none righteous in this room. There is none good in this room. None. No, not one. then when did you ever come to a day when you absolutely don't know what to do? And God calls you through a preacher. And he tells you, I want to tell you the good news. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he raised again the third day. And this is according to scripture. This is not something Paul made up. It's something Paul wrote. And if you'll trust that, God will seal you with that Holy Spirit of promise.
And how'd you get sealed? You heard the gospel of Christ. And that's exactly what God said. So I ask people, say, when were you justified? Well, I was justified when God's son was raised from dead. How would you possibly know that? The God of this world knows that, folks. If you never hear you were justified and you're continually trying to get justified, you'll never be justified. He knows who's preaching justification. He knows Brother Steve. He knows Brian, Jerry, Mark. He knows the people that do that. He knows that when Dan goes across the big pond over there, there's somebody bringing justification to him. And he fights them. But you know what? There are other people you don't know or that have left you still believe in the faith too. And I thank God for that. You know, people have personality clashes, no doubt. It'd be a lovely world if we all just walked around like robots and same thing, same mind, same everything. Paul tells us to have same mind, same judgment. He didn't say anything about personalities, folks. Hey, there are some people that are outgoing and loud and rambunctious, and there are some people that are not. There are some people that are meek and mild, and there are some people that just jump hell with a chainsaw. But God uses them all. Maybe you don't think God's using you. Well, first of all, you've got to be saved. But if you are saved, he'll use you. And you'll be used for his glory. Amen. And he don't share it, remember. He don't share it. And there's no need of you going around bragging about what you did because you didn't. You glory in the cross of Christ, as Robbie sang. And that faith that came is Jesus Christ. Like he had the faith to satisfy the Father. Isn't that amazing? For a Gentile like me, God gave me hope. He gave me the inheritance. He gave me everything I praise him for that. If you're lost in here, why don't you quit being proud? Right now. Just stop. You say, well, I'd be embarrassed if I told it or I showed it. Good. Better to be ashamed here than there. Trust him right now. It's already done. Nothing needs to be done. Trust him, and he will seal you forever. Amen.